welcome to a further edition of the Intent Discussions. I am Anna Putsarimhagen and my guest today is Esko Skatema, the founder of the Skatema Human Excellence Group. Very welcome, so glad to have you here. Thank you very much, Anna. So today we're going to discuss the relationship between predatory and receptive attention and um, I'd like to frame it around leadership. I find this very intriguing and a little bit hard to understand. Like I can understand this is really important and I don't really yet get it. I love to be in that place. So um, would you please start by describing what is predatory and receptive attention? Uh, so I know um, the easiest way to explore the difference is is experiential. So imagine you were sitting somewhere and you commented on somebody else's behavior with regard to you by saying, he is looking at me. Mm. That's scenario one. Scenario two, uh, you're commenting on the person's behavior and you're saying, he's listening to me. Now, the question is, mm -hmm. will there be a different emotional experience to those two bits of comment? So, so what would be your emotional experience if you said the person is looking at me? Like he's on to, on to the thing? So, onto you, a very active and looking thing. at you, yeah. Mm. yeah. Yes. And if he's the person listen, listening to you, well, that that's got a, a very kind ring to it. The the looking at could be a bit threatening, I guess, but the listening to doesn't feel threatening at all. So, so that. Um, that's kind of the difference between the, the two fundamental, these two fundamental ways of using attention. I mean, the one is consistent with the idea of being looked at or the person looking at. Um, you know, mm. <clears throat> I mean, it, if, this is in my youth, um, uh, you know, this is how I saw bar fights start. There's a normally a kind of a, a sentence that precedes the first punch. And the sentence is, what are you looking at? You know, um, uh, <laughs> kind of like, you know, yeah. um, uh, you know, stop looking at me. Kind of like there's so and it's because there's something, you know, the one way of describing it is is onto you, as you said, and a step sort of up in terms of the scale of experiences that it's a bit threatening. Because in a sense, that person's attention is mm. penetrating into you. It's kind of like, and so one has, an, has a sense that you want to defend yourself. You want to protect yourself from this. That's when the person is looking at you. Mm. Whereas when the person's listening to you, it's a different experience. It's not, they're not trying to come into you. They're allowing you into them. So... Uh, so it's more like an invitation. No, so it's like, it. And that's why it's more receptive. So, so there's two ways of, that one can mm. use one's attention. The one is consistent with the idea of he's looking at, in other words, it's predatory. And the second is he's listening to me, which is receptive. In other words, the person isn't trying to bore into you. They're kind of inviting you to come into them. Um, the, 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 and the reason why it's appropriate to think of the distinction between these two as predatory um, as opposed to receptive, you know, we, we are predators. And um, uh, 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 the principal sense of all of our senses that we that are concerned with predation is actually our eyesight, because we've got predators' eyes. What makes a predator's eyes different from any other species, uh, sort of a, a prey animal's eyes, is that a predator's eyes, like a lion's eyes, is in the front of its head. And the, the eyes in front mm. of the head allows the lion to have depth perception. And that depth perception allows the lion to work out uh, basically goal-directed action. You know, the, 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 the buck or the, the prey is going to do this and then I'm going to do that. And the so that's what your, the predator's eyes allow us to do. It allows us to focus, allows us to work out depth, allows us to work out what we are trying to get. You know? 
Whereas mm. um, um, the the uh, 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 a prey animal like a buck, uh, a herbivore, their eyes always sit on the side of the head. Their eyes are not in the front of the head. And the reason why the eyes are on the side of the head is that their attention is not really designed to kind of to be concerned with what they want to go and get. The attention is more designed with what's in a sense what's coming towards them, what's trying to get them. In other words, their, their visual attention is about receiving rather than, than predating. Mm. And because we are such visual beings and because we are predators, we've got eyes like lions, when we engage vision, we are basically engaging this first way of using our attention. And it is the way of the use of attention of a predator. That's why we refer, it as, refer to it as predatory attention. Now, mm. you can see, so, so the problem with predatory attention is that it creates, first of all, it creates a, it creates a dangerous self. A self that's dangerous to the, to the other, to the world. I mean... When the lion's in the like a lion, you mean? Yes, exactly. So, so I mean, think oh. about predatory attention as the desire to get. And mm. what are you trying to get? You're trying to get that. You're trying to get the other. You're trying to get what is in the other. So, mm. when you engage predatory attention, you you're basically pursuing the other. You're pursuing the outcome, which is always in the other. It's uh, so so. You know, the question is how how do the um, how do the uh, how do the buck behave? How do the prey animals behave when the lion's in the field? Well, very sensibly, they they run away. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So so if your if your attention functions in a predatory sense, then the 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 result of that is that you are experienced as dangerous by other. And you have mm. to understand that everything you you want to get, anything that you want to get in the world comes from the other to the self. There's nothing, this is categorically true. If you want to get something, the thing that you're getting doesn't sit in the power of the self, it sits in the power of the other. And if you construct yeah. your attention in such a way that the other experiences you as dangerous, then basically the other is programmed to withhold what you want. So you work very hard because you don't receive it, you have to go and take it. It doesn't come towards you, you pursue it. <laughs> So, so this is the discipline. So then it becomes sort of. Um... Sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, this becomes sort of. Carry on. Then it becomes um, sort of proving itself, right? That you have to go out and get it because it it's not coming right. to you because it's running away from you. Is that what you mean? Right. And then you have to run harder and it goes faster and you run harder. And it, yeah. And, 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 uh, <laughs> oh, God. So, so this is the tragedy of predatory attention. Predatory attention. It really is the law, operates by the law of diminishing returns. Um, you know, a, a mm. metaphor that I'm really fond of because it explores, it describes so many things in our lives. This is really drinking salt water for thirst. The thing that you want, you work so hard at getting, but, but because your attention is structured in a predatory way, what you're getting becomes more elusive, which means you need to work harder. You need to become more predatory, which means it eludes you more. And eventually, it just is an absolutely exhausting and unsustainable project. You see. That's the problem with the use of predatory attention. So I can see how we can use the, the lion to understand the predatory attention. But um, does, does the buck work as an analogy for receptive attention? I was thinking a buck, I guess, would live in fear for the predators. Yeah, but that's that, so. So that's that's kind of where the only place where the buck is useful as an, as a metaphor is to understand how the eyesight works, because it's showing oh, okay. that, that any given sense can operate in fundamentally one of two ways, um, and mm. because a lion's eyes and a buck's eyes are so completely differently structured, it helps us to explore this difference between attention to what you want to get and attention what. Is, is trying to get you is the one way of framing it. Mm. The other way of framing it is attention to what you are going towards or attention to what's coming towards you. Yes, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be with fear. It doesn't it's have just to be with fear. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now mm. the thing is that 
wouldn't it be fantastic if you worked with the world in such a way that your attention is experienced to be kind, like the attention of a, a listening person is kind. You know, a person, the person is examining you, looking at you, that is experienced, as we said, as mm. hostile or threatening. Whereas a person is listening to you, the attention is kind. So if one had that kind of attention, a kind attention, then the other, the categorical other, the other, the place where all the things that you want is, are housed, doesn't flee you, it comes towards you. Oh, yes. So that's, what, mm -hmm. so that's what the use of receptive attention enables. Receptive attention enables uh, um, the, uh, uh, an experience of life where the, this, the, the, what you, what you are, are want from life comes towards you rather than you have to go pursue it. You know, mm. you, you know, and you and do I understand correctly then that you mean that this this is what normally or this is what wants to happen. So if you stop chasing, that is what will happen. Yeah, that's exactly right. And in fact, the 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 problem is even more subtle and nuanced than this. And and it's kind of it's demonstrated in the discipline of horse whispering. Now now horse whispering. Uh, um, if I understand it correctly, and I, I do speak under correction, but this is what I've, I've been led to understand about horse whispering. A, ho a horse whisperer goes into a, um, a corral with a wild horse that's never been backed, never been tamed before. And when the horse whisperer first walks into the, the arena with the horse, he looks at the horse. Now, bear in mind that horses are prey animals. They've got their eyes on the side of their head, and we're predators. We've got eyes like lions. The horse whisperer looks at the horse and kind of quietly sort of moves up to the horse while he's looking at them. And eventually the horse really doesn't like this because if you know, it's mm. like, what do you want? What do you? So the horse tries to move away. And then once the horse whisperer is convinced that the horse is really uh, hooked, the horse's attention is hooked. The horse whisperer deliberately looks away. Does this. The horse cannot stand that. Completely freaks the horse out. It's almost as if there's a piece of horse logic going on into that thick skull saying, why doesn't he like, why doesn't he want me anymore? So, mm -hmm. so, so mm -hmm. and, and but with playing this trick with attention, a horse whisperer can back a horse with no violence, you know, not like you see in the Wild West movies of this bucking bronc and so nothing. Oh, like no, no. no violence mm -hmm. at all. The horse whisperer has backed the horse and is riding the horse in one day. A wild horse has just come off the felt. You know, um, it's quite miraculous. And it's all because of how they work with their attention. So the thing is, there is a place for goal directed predatory attention. The problem is, we mm -hmm. overuse it. So, <clears throat> uh, another way of, of translating what we mean by the difference between predatory and receptive attention is to think about the relationship between outcome and process. Um, uh, uh, so, so if, you, if, you are, if your attention is predatory, you're really only concerned with the outcome. And the process is the price that you have to pay. And almost by definition, as soon as you frame something like that, it's going to be difficult. It's the price that I have to pay to get the outcome. Mm. So, so if you're thinking of the lion again, it would be the buck. The buck. Chase. So I'm, I'm so chasing the chase the buck. Is... Yeah, that's right. So, yeah. so when my attention is working in a predatory way, my, I'm, my attention is on outcome and mm. process the thing that I'm doing moment by moment in the situation that I'm in is the means, is the price I have to pay to achieve the outcome. Mm. When my attention operates in a receptive way, I'm still aware of the outcome. But I'm much more concerned with how I'm dealing with the immediacy, the situation that I'm in. In other words, the, 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 the moment as it comes towards me, rather than oh. the thing I'm trying to get. Hmm. So if we translate this into activity, the act, let's say, for instance, the person is, is walking up the mountain. So if you, you're not, you have no, you know, 
no tool to interrogate their intent. You're looking at them from the outside, from a third person point of view. And you can just see the person is clearly walking up the mountain. Then suddenly you get given the opportunity to interrogate what's going on inside them, in their intent. Mm. The first way of framing what's going on inside them is to say, he is walking to get to the top of the mountain. His intent is, I'm my, is to get to the top of the mountain and he's going to, to walk to get there. In other words, that's, he, that's when his own attention is operating in a predatory way. Because he's, the, aim, the, the end is the, is, is the top of the mountain and the means is the walking. When the person's attention is operating in, rece in a receptive way, they overturn that logic. Basically, they, the point is to have a good walk. Their attention is in the process, in the moment that they're in, and dealing appropriately and well with the moment, with the situation that they're in, the next step, quite literally. That doesn't mean to say that the, the, that they, the top of the mountain is irrelevant, because actually they want a good walk. They want to walk well. You know, but you can't walk well if there's no challenge. So that the, mm. in other words, the top of the mountain becomes their means to walk well. Mm. So a person who's operating predatory attention would be walking up the mountain to get to the top of the mountain. The person who's using their attention in a receptive sense um, is using the top of the mountain to have a good walk. From the outside, you see the same thing: a person walking to the top of the mountain. The, mm. On the inside, you interrogate the intent of the person. The first person, the walking is, is, the, is, is the means, and the top of the mountain is the end. The second person, the person who's using the attention in a receptive way, the top of the mountain is the means, and the walking is the end. And probably then the first person is struggling, and the second one is enjoying the walk. Well, that's exactly the difference. You know, that's exactly yeah. the difference. And you'll actually, I'm sure, if one interrogated if one had some way of examining how they felt afterwards, I mean, we know, we, I mean, the first person would be depleted by the walk mm. and the second person would be nourished by the walk. So I guess this is speculative, but um, what would you say? Which of the two persons would reach the top first? Well, it would be the second person. Not only will they reach the top first, but they would... So, so this is this is true for any person who's done long distance um, uh, sport, um, you know, whether it's um, running or cycling or swimming. And you would know because you're a cycler, you're a cyclist yourself. You know, I mean, if you if you keep if you keep on keep if you keep your attention on wanting to get there, the outcome, the outcome, you get completely <laughs> exhausted. But if you really want to get there, then just think about the next meter. Deal with the next step on the cycle properly. Make sure that your breathing is good. Make sure you properly, your, your posture is good. Keep your attention in the situation that you're in. When you look up, then well, amazing, you're at the outcome. But when, you, when you're struggling and I've just got to get there, I've just got to get there, I've just got to get there, you know, it's like your attention. That's a, very often you don't even get there because you get so exhausted by doing it, you give up. Mm -hmm. so, no, so, that is true, actually. Yes, you're right. So any, any endeavor that requires real struggle, any endeavor that is really concerned with, that requires fortitude and patience, is really mm -hmm. sorely challenged by predatory attention. Because predatory attention makes that almost impossible. So would that be the main reason why you think receptive attention is important in leadership? No. So what's the, so, what's the so, main so, thing there? So, 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 the, 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 so, I mean, it is an important variable. Because ask yourself how many... Um, how many executives that you know uh, are experience their lives as being incredibly stressful? Ah, uh, yes. And most they of would. them do, you know. Mm. Um, if you uh, and and um, and suffer all the the symptomatic uh, kind of issues that are associated with it, and it's precisely because their attention is predatory, they themselves get exhausted by their day to day activity. 
you know. Mm. I mean, that, so the first thing you need to understand about predatory attention is that predatory, the first thing predatory attention consumes is the, is the subject, is the person who's using it. Mm. I mean, if I, I mean, my, the whole point is to get there. And how am I going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do things to get there. In other words, the first resource that gets used to get there is, is me, is the self. And any resource, mm. when you use it, it gets consumed, it gets exhausted. So, so no, no wonder that just being in the average executive skin requires either huge amounts of time in a gym or lots of yoga or <laughs> Prozac. You know, I mean, that's kind of like, yeah. you know, it's an insufferable place to be in or lots of wine and cigarettes, but then they die quickly, but they, maybe that's not a bad thing. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, so, so, so that's the one problem, the problem, and that's the, the principal problem that you're referring to is that it's actually an insufferable experience to be like that, but worse. What, you know, why, why, why is, is predatory attention hostile to leadership? Because this result that the leader is trying to achieve or that the, the, the head of the organization is being held accountable for. If the head of the organization tries to manage people in such a way where it's all goal-directed and their attention is all predatory, actually the people who are supposed to be delivering this outcome become hostile to the leader. Yes. They therefore withhold. And the withholding isn't even deliberate. You know, they, that's the kind of, so, so they no longer are deliberately on the leader's side. They no longer have a collaborative intent towards the leader. So does that have directly to do with the predatory receptive attention? Or is it the fact that if you're a predatory, if your attention is predatory, you're behaving like a taker? That's and exactly if right. your attention is receptive, exactly right. you're a giver, and then people will want to That's work exactly with you. Right. Yeah. Okay, so you're chasing people away and you're chasing results away as well. That's right. And you don't even have to formulate your intent like that because it's, it oozes out of your eyes. Mm. Maybe you're not even aware. Yeah, you know, this is why this attention thing is so subtle. Mm. Um, um, <clears throat> so you can have somebody who who goes to all the right leadership courses, et cetera, and they still look disaster in a leadership position. And they still cultivate people around them who are completely disgruntled and hostile. And they can't understand why. Well, it's because of how their attention operates. You know, they, they, it's all about visions and goal-directed action and outcome and, and you know, um, uh, and very little attention to process and very little attention to the people themselves. So um, I'd say I almost expect, uh, I almost experience that rather uh, to be the social norm, to be predatory. Like it's something that is encouraged to work, be goal driven. It's something you'd put in your CV, like uh, very <laughs> proudly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is true. And I do think that that is particularly true of our current civilization mm. and I also think it's run its course I think we've come as far as we can with that way of looking at things well, that sounds encouraging that, that's uh, that um, that uh, because I mean if we took two steps back out of our current situation and say you know, what has been the result of this excessive use of predatory attention? Well, first of all, in most countries in the world, it's actually established a non-virtuous social contract where those in charge are actually, with, 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 with those at the bottom of the society are hostile to those in charge of the society. Mm. You know? There's like a cynicism in the social contract. The rich are only there for themselves. The powerful are only there for themselves. That's one of the implications of predatory attention. The second implication of predatory attention is that um, the, uh, um, is the, the environmental implication of this. Because when your attention is predatory, everything becomes a resource to be consumed. Mm. And clearly, the, 
this is not, it's, it's obvious that this is not sustainable. But the last, the last asp, uh, kind of uh, aspect of this, the implication of predatory attention, I think, is, 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 is the most interesting and is probably where it's, the roots of its undoing are going to lie. And that is that predatory attention is actually fundamentally deeply alienating for the person who operates it. For the, the self. For the self, yeah. So, 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 the, so, I mean, the problem with predatory attention is it's inherently competitive. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you're treating the other as prey. So it's win-lose. I mean, we can't, you know, the line doesn't come to a negotiated settlement with a, with a, with a, with a buck, you know. <laughs> so you give me your hind leg and I'll, let, kind of, uh, I'll give you my, 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 my left paw. It doesn't work like that. So it's win-lose. I mean, the problem with predatory mm. is that it's deeply competitive. It's win-lose. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the key issue with win-lose is that it ends you up in a state of alienation. You know, I mean, for me to win, you have to lose. And if I do that frequently enough, I'm the only person left standing. You know, I'm completely on my own. And I see this very frequently with senior people that I consult with. You know, the, the, the first thing that's true for their, their, their life experience is they're deeply lonely people. Yes. They're deeply alienated. So um, it's very encouraging to hear you say that you think there will be a difference in this arena. Have you seen any signs of it? Well, I, I, I dare say, I mean, we are having this, this conversation <laughs> in, uh, in the middle of the, the, the COVID pan pandemic. Hmm. And um, I think many of us are surprised that, you know, we're not working and, the, and basically the sun still came up this morning and this, you know, this kind of, and in <laughs> fact, things seem to be working better. I mean, astonishing. Yeah. I Isn't mean, that the, interesting? The, there are more birds in the sky. There's more, the children aren't coughing so much with the, I mean, apart from the disease, but they're not coughing with the, the effluent that we're kind of pumping into the, the atmosphere. And, you know, it's just, everything just seems, I can see the horizon from, from my flat. That I, I mean, I couldn't see, I haven't, I've lived here for 36 years. I've not seen it like that before. So it's, mm. uh, uh, everything's changing. So I'm, uh, I'm hoping that people are going to come out of this, with a desire to shift because you know, I know there, had, there already has been a shift and it's been a quite a long-term thing. So when I started work in the late eighties, uh, uh, was when I started consulting, um, you know, if, if I would have asked a group of executives, the question, why does, uh, you know, you know, how, how do you measure the success of a business without batting an eye, they would all say, profits mm. so without right. a question it is all about the unbridled pursuit of the interests of the shareholder it is all about what the business can take that was the idea today there's nobody says that anymore at all particularly if they've been to a business school <laughs> I mean, they'll always refer to the triple <laughs> bottom line now. I mean, they do. They say it's yeah. about customers, it's about employees, and it's about owners. It's about yeah. you know, the market, um, the social contract, and however you want to phrase it. Is that, in other words, it's now the triple bottom line that's in vogue and not the bottom line. Now, that's saying yeah. there's been a shift in the conscious of this establishment. There's an insight. So I know that you work a lot with um, personal development, like individual mm. personal mm. development and the different stages uh, for individuals, both yeah. from an intent perspective and attention perspective. Um, um, do you think that there is a parameter like that for us as a whole? Like I, as think a society? So. I think so. I mean, because in a sense, every, every individual alive is an individual datum point to a collective, I mean, to, to, to an, a collective abstraction. So, the individual datum points are mm. changing, then surely the, you know, the aggregate must be changing. Mm, because I can recognize what you're saying um, now for like a society level mm. and what you've said before on an individual level that you get into the next phase when you're sort of fed up with the former one yeah. and it doesn't take you any further. And, and that's what I hear you say about the leadership and the society now. You know, we've lived in, since the Second World War, 
We've lived in the yeah. most peaceful time in human history. It's unprecedented. It's referred to as the long peace. I have a, uh, a friend who's a Greek person who, um, well, he's a Greek descent. His parents are Greek. He speaks Greek and he still considers himself to be more Greek than South African, than anything else, you know, although he was born here. And um, uh, he had made uh, uh, um, quite a bit of money with being part of a very successful uh, entrepreneurial venture. And he was going to go back to Greece. And this was just at the time when Greece hit that first trouble. I don't know if you remember that. I mean, you must remember that. First time yes, yes. there was a bust up at the EU with, with Greece and, and there were mm. big, big financial trouble. So I said to him, why on earth are you going back to Greece now? This is nuts. Then do you, haven't you been watching the news? He said, what are you talking about? I said, this financial catastrophe. He says, the Greeks know they've never had it better than what they have it now. I said, what on earth do you mean? He said, do you know this generation is the first generation in 3,000 years that have not known war? Mm. Isn't that yeah, I mean, war must war must be very predatory. Yeah. So, so for for you know, I mean, but because it was you know, the, I mean, the, the the fight in Greece didn't stop with the Second World War because there was still a very big um, there was still a, a, a big uh, uh, civil war that anteceded the Second World War. You know, this this place has known continuous bloodshed, not patches of continuous bloodshed for three millennia. Mm. You know, now most of Europe, I mean, apart from the Balkans, most of the Europe, most of Europe has been like that. Up until the Second World War, you were at each other's throats continuously. Mm. Now that's saying that there has surely there's been a shift in the consciousness of people. Fewer and fewer people, year by year, fewer and fewer people are dying by violent means than the year before internationally. Fewer and fewer people are by and dying because of military action. And, 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 and this includes the horrifying statistics that we get from the American actions in places like Afghanistan or the, uh, you know, the, 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 the troubles in the Middle East and ISIS. And all of that together pales into yeah. insignificance to where, where we were, would have been in the 60s. You know, if you consider in the 60s, all the world wars of liberation happening throughout the world, and where we would have been in the 50s and where we would have been in the 40s of the Second World War. So we are in a spirit of really protracted peace, unprecedented peace. You know, so surely we're different as a species. We're finding fewer and fewer reasons to kill each other. <laughs> that is good news for sure. So uh, this blog post that I read recently that you wrote uh, on the topic of predatory and receptive attention, uh, in the framing of leadership was talking about leadership uh, in crisis. And um, even though if we're not killing each other, we do have this horrible virus that is now uh, making a, a big impact on all of the world. And um, would you say that receptive attention, leadership with receptive attention is even more important in a time of crisis? So I, I want to give you an example. Um, I, I, I did a, a webinar this morning that experimented on the edge of kind of reasonably catastrophic failure. And it is because I, I, I saw something right at the beginning of this thing that threw me that I didn't quite know how to handle. And rather than just, so for the first few minutes, I was so concerned with the outcome that I went into a panic mm. and I was overwhelmed by the experience. And it took some real discipline to kind of force myself, well, let's just do one step at a time. Let's just do the, you know, let's just get through this. Let's just get through the next two slides without stuttering. And maybe things will get better. And indeed things did seem to get better for me after that. So, 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 so this is a metaphor uh, it's, a, it's kind of, you know, for, for how we deal with crisis. The moment we see, we experience as us being at the edge of catastrophic collapse. While we're looking at the collapse, we are, com we are, we are completely powerless. When you're looking at 
big outcomes and particularly big catastrophic outcomes, you know, you, it, it, it's a paralyzing experience. The terror becomes mm. a paralyzing experience. And then generally what you do is not well thought through and it's always a behavior, is always acting in panic. If you manage to shift your attention from the big catastrophe to what is the, what can I do right now? And I try and do that thing as eloquently as possible, as calmly as possible. And I actually make handling the thing as well as I can, the point of being in the situation, not trying to get out of the Mm. situation, the point of being in the, handling the situation. In other words, shift my attention deliberately to the process rather than the outcome. That's when I start getting the kind of level head in, that helps me to govern, uh, to, helps me to get to a better place. You see, one of the problems with predatory attention is that it makes you blind to everything else. Uh, yes. You see, I mean, so because, I mean, you, you, you see, it's one of the issues with the idea of focus. You know, I mean, when, when I focus, then by definition, I push everything that I'm not focusing on into the background. It becomes peripheral. Mm. You know, um, now when I'm in a situation where there's looming catastrophe, chances are the thing that I'm focused on isn't necessarily the right thing to do. Because I'm out of my depth, it's catastrophic. I'm, you know, I don't know what to do. So, so, so unless I'm an absolute genius and I cotton on to by luck the one thing, this, this exclusive focus thing is going to be problematic. If I I have receptive attention, I'm not just that concerned with the one thing I want to get. I'm concerned with the many, I'm more interested in the many things that are coming towards me because out of the many things, there might be one thing, which is probably better than my thing that I wanted to get, which is probably the right thing to do. In other words, you become more creative. You're calmer. You literally see more. So you see more of the opportunities in the inherent in the situation. When your receptor, when your attention is predatory, you see very little. You blink it. You're just focused on the thing you're after. You don't see mm. opportunity. So I guess that can also be linked to fear. If you're really afraid of something, yeah, then you sort of focus on that, and you don't see the possibilities of. Right. Well, that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. What would you suggest for someone who's now listening to you and says, wow, I want to be a more receptive leader. <laughs> what, what should they do? Or a more receptive person. I mean, right. it's not only for people in leading positions, I guess. Well, dare I say, receptive attention is the equivalent of cultivating mindfulness. And there's, I mean, mercifully, since the 60s, there's also been quite a development in the sort of the accessibility of ideas of mindfulness. Um, you know, with uh, stronger or, or more accessibility, uh, more and more accessible sort of um, meditative program, uh, practices, etc. So the first thing I'd say is find some method that resonates with your sense of mindfulness that you're comfortable with, you know. And, and, and I mean, for, for maybe for some people, it might mean going back to the religious tradition that they come out of, you know, because then it helps you because developing a, developing a prayer life is also a way to become more mindful. Um, you know, there's all sorts of things one can do, but that would be the, that would be the, the most important thing I think is to deliberately start cultivating an attitude of mindfulness in one's day to day life experience. So where I come from in Sweden, I think many people would say, go out into the nature, take a walk in the forest something like that that could be that that could work yes Mm. yeah but it has to do with calming down and backing off and letting things come to you is that Mm. correctly yes letting things come to to you and this is the really sort of disturbing truth to this Letting things come to you to the point where you recognize that there's an inherently benign design to things that's not hostile to your interests. That's actually, um, uh, that is uh, consistent with your interest. Your life, your life works. I mean, that's the conviction that receptive attention puts us into. Once you have the experience that the world that you're in 
uh, is orchestrates in your favor, um, uh, you start to realize that uh, uh, the world that you're in is not is not random and it's not hostile. Mm. So, in other words, you're having you start to see that the world is both your benefactor and your ally. Your life, the universe, the, anything other than you is not blind and it's not arbitrary. It's your benefactor and your ally. That life experience is actually the life experience of a person who is well-versed in receptive attention. So it would then take a bit of courage to, to lean back and uh, allow this to happen, I guess. Exactly, exactly. How can the world demonstrate to you that it's your ally if you keep on intervening in your own interest? Well, I'd like that to be the, the final comment, if you don't mind, because that's Thank very, you very much, Anna. thoughtful. Thank you very much.